Hello everyone, uh, this is yet another episode of Career Talks by Welcome Solutions and in these uh, meetings we talk with professionals who have fascinating career paths behind and who are willing to share their life hacks with us. And today I have great pleasure to introduce uh, Mark Bayer, who helps scientists, engineers and organizations get funding, gain influence and build relationships with their most important stakeholders, including members of Congress, investors and the public with custom crafted uh, true to life communication training and government relation services. Tailoring his unique 360 degree approach to the specific needs of his clients, he creates and implements high impact solutions. His methodology is shaped by two decades of work across the government, corporate and nonprofit uh, sectors as chief of staff in the US Senate and House of Representatives management consultant for Price Water and Waterhouse Coopers and a co-founder and board chairman of a non-profit organization. Uh, thank you so much, Mark, for joining us today. Great to have you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Natalia. Um, and I would like to uh, listen to your story more from your own perspective, since it sounds so, uh, yeah, it sounds fascinating, especially the part related to the Congress and, and the House of Representatives. How did it happen that you went this way? And uh, can you tell us a bit more about um, everything that is behind your uh, impressive uh, LinkedIn profile? Well, thanks for that. I appreciate the kind comments about it. Um, so, you know, I had always been interested in government and politics growing up in at home. And the news was a topic that we discussed, current events and all that stuff. And when I was in school, I studied government and French. Actually, I lived in Paris for a while. And I was just always interested in how change happens, big change happens in our world and how to motivate people and persuade. And so I had an opportunity after I graduated college to start working on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC, in the US House of Representatives. And I was fortunate to be working for a member of Congress whose name is Ed Markey. He's still, now he's a US Senator. Uh, he was a US representative when I started working for him and I also worked for him as a US Senator. But I uh, had a chance to really have sort of, a, I guess you could call it like an all access pass to how policy and big decisions get made and working closely with leaders to see how this happens. And it combines a lot of the skills and interests that I have, um, persuasion, a lot of verbal, you know, uh, opportunities to speak in public, clear writing, um, and then just, you know, sort of trying to figure out how do you move from point A to point B when you're thinking about, you know, changing the way a major policy happens. And I can give some examples of projects I worked on a little bit later. In Welcome Solutions, we help highly educated professionals with navigating towards their dream careers. We offer intensive career rotation courses, combining self-discovery with practical information about the job market. We also work on our own educational materials, such as books and self-navigation manuals. Our new tool, the Odyssey Test, will help you discover what your natural way of creating value in the job market is and which working environment will fit you best. If you'd like to stay in touch with us and receive monthly updates, please subscribe to the newsletter. Um, and then I left after about four years and I went to the Kennedy School of Government, which is at Harvard University for my master's and spent two years there. My course is really focused on negotiation, uh, persuasion, you know, there was economics and statistics, as well as some management courses. And then when I graduated, I decided, you know, I had worked in government on Capitol Hill in, in Washington, I had majored in government, I had gone to the Kennedy School of Government, and I decided, look, I really want to understand the corporate sector, and see how, you know, these types of elements, these skills and others, are applied. And so that's when I went to work for Price Waterhouse Coopers, which is a management consulting company uh, in the US and, and abroad, and had a chance to work inside a larger company on some topics. And I really enjoyed that. I liked the team aspect of it, our small team working at government, a lot of government agencies trying to make them more efficient, and all the issues that organizations encounter culture, performance, and all that kind of thing. 
Um, and then I was recruited to go to a startup actually. And now I was moving further away from government because our clients were big financial firms and um, some uh, telecom firms, media firms, and so forth. Um, and I enjoyed that too. Most of my colleagues were either MBAs or they were computer science people. And again, I, I really enjoyed getting a window into that culture and exercising and learning some skills that I hadn't really in the past. After the September 11th attacks happened, you know, of course, there was the, the um, bombing, the suicide bombing at the Pentagon, which was very close to where I was working, actually, just over the river. Um, I got a call back, and of course, the World Trade Center and the, and the field in Pennsylvania as well. Um, the two of those planes had taken off from Boston's Logan Airport, which is my hometown. I grew up, was born in Boston. I grew up about 20 miles west of Boston, Massachusetts. And so I got a call from my old office, the Markey office. Uh, Ed Markey at that time was representing an area north and west of Boston, uh, asking if I'd be interested in returning to the office in a different role. And so I accepted, I was really after the 9-11 attacks looking to get back into government. I felt like this was a critical moment and that I was sort of on the sidelines and ready to get back in to the action, so to speak. And so I went back and I spent the next five years or so working on aviation security, airline security to try to prevent another breach like the one that resulted in the terrorist attacks on September 11th, 2001. And um, I, my, one, of my, one of my big focuses at that point was requiring or changing the US policy to require that all of the air cargo that is stored on passenger planes is actually subject to the same screening as passengers checked bags. And so it might've been sort of counterintuitive to think that wasn't already being done. There are about 6 billion pounds of air cargo every year that goes on US Air, you know, all, all the major carriers, uh, Delta, American, JetBlue, and so forth. And that was becoming a bigger issue because after 9-11 and fewer people were actually flying because they were afraid, the airlines to make up revenue started carrying more of this commercial cargo in the belly of the plane, right next to where your check bags go. And none of that was being physically screened uh, for explosives or for bombs. So all this security on the, they call it sort of the, you know, the um, upside of the top side of the airport with the metal detectors and all these new types of security measures to detect explosives, while underneath for the air cargo operation, none of that cargo was being screened physically. So it was subject to a paperwork check, sort of like you going to the airport and just showing your ID and then walking around the metal detector and not going through. So we thought that was a huge loophole. And I was um, really at the front of working with my boss on that to try to change that policy. And uh, it was five years of all these different efforts. When I say blood, sweat, and tears, uh, we worked with the flight attendants. We worked with families of the September 11th victims. Um, we worked with some unions and uh, we had a lot of opposition uh, from the airlines and from the administration from the White House at the time to, to that. Uh, but nonetheless, we prevailed and it got signed into law um, as part of the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission, which was set up to prevent another 9-11 attack. After that, um, I became the, the deputy chief of staff and legislative director in the office, then the chief of staff in the office. And then, uh, then Representative Markey decided to run for the U.S. Senate because there was a, from Massachusetts, because there was an open seat once John Kerry was appointed Secretary of State by President Obama. He left his Senate seat from Massachusetts, leaving this opening. And um, as Chief of Staff for, for Markey, uh, I worked closely with him as part of that effort. Uh, two campaigns, uh, both successful, and uh, then became Chief of Staff of the office in the U.S. Senate. And um, at that point, I thought, you know, about 20 years in two success, you know, two separate tours of duty, so to speak, um, I wanted to do something else. And 
that sort of <laughs> brings us to what I do now. It's something different, but related in, in many ways. Right, amazing, amazing story. Um, well, I will drill more about on these reasons for leaving because, um, well, American politics, I mean, at least for us Europeans, it's, uh, it always seems uh, fascinating. <laughs> we follow closely. And um, yeah, my, my, yeah I, I, my first question would be, uh, weren't you um, tempted to uh, get to the hill as an active politician yourself? Like when you were <laughs> observing all these people getting, uh, getting into power and getting yeah, the initiatives, you know, pursuing their initiatives in the Congress, uh, did you ever feel tempted to do the same? No. Uh, and it's funny because uh, it's a good question and it's not uncommon. And there are many examples of this, of a chief of staff in particular running for the boss's seat when the boss either retires or gets elected, you know, to another office. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I felt like I was as close to that experience as I wanted to be. Um, I saw the you know, the, the good, the good parts and the bad parts. I think overall, it's really, if you want to do the job well, and, and I would, you know, have to throw myself into it completely. Um, there's really not a firewall between your personal life and your professional life, as far as you're kind of always on call. Um, and I, and I was when I was a staffer too. Um, but you know, you have to sort of abandon things that you would, you would normally do in your your personal life because you don't have time for them or they're, they're interrupted by work on the weekends, you know, constantly. And I just felt like that, that wasn't the lifestyle that I wanted. Um, I wanted, and, and I felt like I really maxed out on the experience and there wasn't a lot more for me to, to achieve at that point. Um, so um, I, I wasn't tempted. I know a lot of people might find that funny or strange, but, um, you know, I really was hungry to do something different and apply my skills in, in a different way. Right, right. All right. So, uh, well, I, I can imagine, uh, I mean, my, myself, uh, I went uh, my own way. So I can imagine that at some point you felt that call to, to, do, to, do, sim to do the same. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about why why you chose this particular path why did you choose to uh to help researchers in communi in crafting better communication skills mm -hmm. and uh, what do you do now and how yeah how do you use all your experience from your previous from from your career to uh, to offer the services that you're uh, offering today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sure well the why is so when i left the hill I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do exactly. And I got calls from people who were interested in having me do different types of projects that were very much related to the typical trajectory for someone like me, which, which would be to lobby full time and, and basically go back to Capitol Hill, but now represent specific interests. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there are all sorts of different interests that people are, are able to petition their government is sort of the, the verb that is in the constitution actually, um, whether it's environment or you know education, every possible issue that, that you could deal with in the public arena you know, there are, there's a constituency for, it. there are people who care about it and they're able to go to Congress and, uh, and try to advance their priorities. I was in so many of those meetings on the other side during those two decades on, on Capitol Hill. But as I was sort of thinking about what I wanted to do, the election in the US happened in 2016, which was a huge surprise for, I think, the entire world, probably both the candidates as well. Um, but after the election, I was really struck initially by all of the lies and deceptions and, you know, all of the uh, misleading information that started coming out from the White House. I mean, it started really the day of the inauguration, which was January 20th, 2017 with a uh, claim about how many people actually attended 
the inauguration and how that compared to President Obama's inauguration. And, you know, there was a string of, of claims coming from the podium and the White House press briefing room, the Brady press briefing room, um, about how there were more people at the Trump inauguration. And I, and, and I just thought that was bizarre. Uh, and then the National Park Service had actual pictures that showed that wasn't the case, but then those pictures were taken down and, and people were reprimanded. And so um, after that, and actually on that Sunday, there was an interview on Meet the Press where, where Kellyanne Conway, who at the time was the a senior counselor to, to Trump, um, said something about this. And when confronted, she said, well, the press secretary gave alternative facts to that. And I thought, like, this is bizarro land. You know, this is really like Orwell territory. And when I worked on Capitol Hill, you know, everything that we did, all the policy work, all was grounded in facts and evidence and data and things that were, were real to the best of our ability to interpret them. And then from there, of course, we had to advocate and persuade and figure out a strategy for advancing the policy. But the policies were all rooted in, in truth to, to the greatest extent that we could divine it. And so when I heard her essentially lying and backing it up, um, I was sort of professionally offended by that. This is not the way policy is made or should be made in the US. Um, but I kind of quickly turned to something um, that kind of reflects my, my overall approach um, professionally and probably personally, which is, well, what are we going to do about it? Is there anything we can do about it? And so I really geeked out on this idea of how do you disabuse or debunk um, these types of, of lies that, that people really started latching onto and believing. And of course, that was only the, the beginning of a long string that stretched throughout the four years. And so, you know, at the time, the media was focused on how many of these lies were, were coming out, these misleading statements, right? And I was focused on how are we going to do something about it and actually set the record straight? And, you know, I come from a little bit of a classics background, meaning, you know, like Greek, Roman, I took three years of Latin, you know, so rhetoric um, and language and etymology, you know, the roots of words and where they come from is something that I just have studied and I, and I really enjoy. And so I really just geeked out on this idea of, well, are there things that we can do to persuade? What's helpful? What's not helpful? Um, and then um, I ended up writing a bit about that. And then in 2018, I went to the annual conference for the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS. And I decided and I had the opportunity to um, speak on a topic which was which I called um, alternative facts and fake news, how to stand up for science when data aren't enough. You know, what do you do when the facts don't persuade people that they're holding on to a false position? And it was an interactive discussion. I really enjoyed it. And it was packed. There were more and more people who kept coming in to the room and they were bringing chairs in and then people were sitting on the floor and it was really interesting to lead that. It wasn't a lecture. It was really me talking about some of my ideas and also hearing from the group. And Science Magazine actually wrote an article about my talk because there was a reporter or a journalist from Science Magazine in the room. And he told me before I started, he was gonna write an article about it. And so there's an article in Science. Um, and so as I started, you know, researching and speaking about it, uh, I found there was a lot of interest. And then I, of course, realized that scientists among probably any career anywhere, you know, care the most about trying to base information or conclusions on data and real information. And I felt that when I was at the conference and it turned out I was sitting next to someone from UNC Chapel Hill who was 
the head of research communications. And she asked me when I told her what I was working on and what I spoke about, she asked me if I'd be a keynote speaker for a symposium that they were having in that June. Uh, and so I did that. And then I began talking more and more to scientists about how they could communicate their research and their information in a way that a non-expert could understand. And, um, and then it sort of just grew, um, grew from, from that. That was really cool. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 can, I can relate because my, my, as the story of my company started very, very much the same way. I, uh, in the uh, June of 2019, I went to a conference in Rome, uh, in Italy, and I gave a workshop. Uh, it was actually just a 20 minute talk as a part of one hour like long workshop on post-academic career tracks. And this was the last day of the conference. And it was a hot day, lunchtime. Uh, you know, the academic community from all around the world came to discuss uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience related topics. Yet the room was full and people were standing. People were standing in the corridor. People were standing, sitting in the floor uh, and standing outside the room even so they couldn't even see the slides they were just standing and listening and i was mm -hmm. like why <laughs> you know uh, and then uh, that was when it hit me how much of a problem this really is and mm -hmm. how many people and that was kind of ir ironic because all these researchers paid for their travel to you know travel across the sea sometimes uh, to uh, to present the research yet mm -hmm. instead of going to a poster session or discussing the research in the corridor they they came here to to listen to our workshop and mm -hmm. the workshop was about how to leave academia <laughs> successfully and um, mm -hmm. and that's when i realized how much of a problem this really is and the first thing i, I did after coming back to to the netherlands was uh, marching straight to the Chamber of Commerce to uh, to set the company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then uh, that's how it all started. So I, I um, the only difference is that science didn't care about my talk apparently because uh, there was no <laughs> follow up article. Um, anyways, uh, I, I can relate. I think this is this is usually the case that to um, to make a change in your career, you need some uh, impulse, you need some stimulus, there must be something. And I see this ha pattern happening uh, in many people's careers, you need some stimulus that will show you, hey, this is this is like it's like a light in the tunnel. This is the direction. Uh, this is a sign. <laughs> right. Of I should be doing this. So, uh, well, in your case, I think it was very clear. Um, science is like a prime, like uh, prime um, channel of information in in academia. So definitely the best place to go. I'm actually curious about what you do today. So. What is the scope of your activities and mm -hmm. uh, how, since I never attended your workshop, not yet, um, I, I'm, I'm curious how your workshops um, look and sure. what uh, do researchers, what can they learn from you and how does the interaction look? Um, so tell us, tell us everything. Sure. Yeah, I'm glad to do it. Thanks for the question and thanks for sharing your story too, Natalia. Um, so I'm doing two, I'm, I can give you a specific examples because I'm doing a workshop right now um, on one topic that I teach and I just finished another online class, teaching an online class on a related subject that I teach. So I'll start with the online class and it's called how to effectively communicate your science to any audience. And it's a four live webinars, so one hour four times, once a week for four weeks. And it's very practical um, in this sense. So I start by teaching, um, and I actually, in this latest round, I partnered with the New York Academy of Sciences, and I had people from all over the world, from Spain, from Israel, from the UAE, um, and, uh, and Mexico, and other parts uh, of the world. and. I start by teaching this methodology that I developed primarily during the time that I was on Capitol Hill, but also it brings together learnings from my time in the corporate world and even in the nonprofit world. 
Um, and so I teach this methodology in the first webinar, and then I give students this framework, and then they actually practice through two rounds of self-recording, which we get, which they complete and then submit, and they get personalized feedback on. And the self-recording is having the students uh, talk about the importance of their research in clear, exciting, engaging terms that even someone like me, who's a non-scientist, can understand. And we do two rounds of that, getting personalized feedback and then trying it again and doing a version 2.0. And there's always a big delta, a big, you know, a big uh, improvement between the first and second versions. And so by the end of the course, the students have a tangible 60 to 90 second video clip of them talking really clearly and in a memorable way about their work using this methodology that I that I came up with. So that's how to effectively communicate your science to any audience for a webinar series. So I just finished teaching that. Uh, and I also limit um, each cohort to 30 students um, because I want to be able to provide really specific feedback to everyone who participates. I'm teaching right now a workshop that I've taught for many years now, which really focuses on policymakers. A lot of scientists interested in talking about advocating for their own research and also for other public policies that they care about, whether it's climate change or the environment more generally. And they wonder how they can get involved in policymaking. And I love teaching this course as well. Um, and it has this hands-on component and it, its focus is the audience for the second workshop, as far as the communications and the persuasion and the advocacy tools, that audience is uh, a policymaker. So how do you talk specifically to, it could be a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, it could be a staff member, it could be someone in parliament somewhere. Um, I've, I've done, done that too for people in the uh, in the Middle East, in the Gulf states too. Um, and it's really, how do you figure out the best way to present your case? And it brings together strands, not just of, you know, things like, well, what are the rhetorical devices to use similes or metaphors or storytelling that you hear about? Um, but it also always, it also brings uh, in something that I really believe that's fundamental and always, and, and often left out of these types of discussions, which is the foundation before you even communicate. And the way I um, phrase it is, you need to connect before you communicate. You really need to establish an understanding and a demonstration that you understand the audience, um, that you may have shared interests, shared values with the audience, some similarities with the audience, which even though they may seem trivial, like from the same hometown or went to the same university or had the same advi PhD advisor, um, you know, these types of things went to the same summer camp. I mean, these are real examples. Um, this need for connection is something that I feel gets underplayed when talking about communication. And I think with, with COVID, people, it, it struck many people like actually having this human to human connection is really important to us. And I think we're wired that way as a non neuroscientist that I, that I am, but I really think that this need to feel connected to our fellow humans is something that began really at the start when we were wandering the savannas and we, we weren't the uh, you know top dog, so to speak, in our environment. We really needed to stick together if we're going to survive. And I feel like that instinct is still very much with us today. So I start with this explanation of connection and what it means and, and how to connect. And then that information that you uncover actually can help fuel or inform your communication, what you say, how you say it, for, for example. So I do the, the, the workshop, 
um, which is called like demystifying Washington DC, um, but it really applies to any kind of policy environment, even if it's local and, and in another country. And then how to effectively communicate your science to any audience. I also do one-on-one um, -on -one coaching, which I um, sometimes happens after a student will take the class or do the workshop. And it's very applicable. The, the principles that I'm teaching are also really applicable to a job interview. So I had a student, you know, University of Chicago, PhD, she had just gotten her PhD. Um, she was looking at machine learning and detection of cancers. And then she decided she wanted to leave academia and interview for a consulting job. Uh, but she was having difficulty translating what she had been doing with her life, you know, academically for several years into how that was going to be valuable to a management consulting firm. And so we, you know, talked about that. And uh, she got some, you know, I think a broader view of, of how to do it. And, you know, she ended up acing the interview and getting the job. She was very happy. And I don't take credit for that. But I think she feels like our time together helped um, refine and focus what she was going to say during during the interview. Uh, I'm sure it helped. I I'm sure it helped. Uh, but actually, uh, I'm curious, um, uh, talking about communication uh, among researchers and like communication, communication problems that researchers often experience, is there any established list that you could just give us now like a list of the most the biggest sins that you that you you see researchers sure. often commit yeah or maybe the other way around uh, like 10 simple rules for success or so sure so what are the what are the uh, what are the possible pitfalls that we should avoid sure i'll start with the pitfalls and some of those will be evident as sort of what to do instead. I think one of the number one things that that happens is the process steps in your description. So, you know, we are generally logical people uh, in, in explaining and scientists in particular. And so there's a there's a tendency to start at the beginning and then so I did this and then I did that and then we tried that and it didn't work. So we went on this other. So those are all to your listener, not interesting. Your listener is most interested in the results and in how what you do affects them or people they care about. And so sometimes I say, you need to start at the finish line, start at the finish line. So you wanna begin with this very relatable and relevant piece of information. I'm working to make sure that no one suffers from lung cancer again. And so, so that's going to grab my attention because, you know, I know what cancer is, you know, I've heard of lung cancer. I know it's a very serious thing. So I'm listening, I'm staying, I'm locked on with you. And then you can tell me a little bit about your research, for example, um, but not, not before you then quickly kind of switch to, well, what I'm doing is sort of like something else that you might've heard of. So these are the techniques we use. It's sort of like trying to find a needle in a haystack. I mean, I, I don't know how you want to do it, but you want to always um, tie what you're saying to something that's relatable to the audience. So that's a big pitfall. People want to start at the beginning, give us all these interim steps. But the problem is that we don't stick around for all of those. And so by the time you get to sort of tell the punchline of the joke, we've completely kind of lost you along the, along the way. So think about that. Try to trim or eliminate process steps and think about what I call the three R's, which are the relevancy, the real world applicability, and the results that you achieve. Those are the things you want to lead with always, because it kind of gets into the second principle that I talk about, which is the principle of primacy and recency, which many of our viewers have probably heard of before. But essentially, it just means that people remember the first thing and the last thing that you say, for the most part. So if I'm telling a story, the first thing that I tell you, if it's relatable and you understand it, you're going to remember. And then in the middle, it can be kind of squishy. Like I, I may dip in and out of, of really paying close attention. But at the end, I sort of tune back in if you haven't completely lost me. And so what I say to folks is after that first 
real engaging beginning, you tie it up at the end with almost a restatement of what you said at the beginning. Um, and you're reinforcing it. And then the person is likely to leave that conversation with an understanding, a better understanding of what you're doing and what your main point is. And so think about that kind of, you know, tying things together. Um, so that is, a, you know, those are sort of couple examples of things that people can do right away to improve their communication. The other thing um, that I found, I, this, this really surprised me. And I, I was, I've, I've done now, you know, as you know, I have a podcast called When Science Speaks. And um, so I've interviewed a lot of people now, probably coming up to 200. Um, and you know, one thing that I found is that the scientists and the researchers who are the best at communicating what they do often are first generation in their family to graduate from college and consequently to get a PhD. And I thought like, you know, why is that? Um, and what I've basically concluded so far is my hypothesis is that when you're in that situation, it doesn't take very long within your family before you have gone beyond what your parents were uh, experienced as part of their own academic time. And so you're now working on topics, maybe as a middle school student, you know, seventh, eighth, 12, 13, 14 years old, that your parents just really don't have any frame of reference for. And so as parents, they're probably going to ask you, so what did you do today in school? And you have to try to explain to them what it is in a way that's number one, clear to somebody who's not familiar with the topic, but number two is not condescending in any way. And that is respectful because they are your parents and a big authority figure in your life. And so the more that happens um, over and over again, um, the better you get at doing your explanations. And um, you know, that goes all the way through your, you know, your, your college, your grad school years. I think my dog right now is at my office door. I'm going to go let her in for a quick second. You can go ahead and ask me a question to tell you. I apologize. Here she is. This is Bella. <laughs> Sweet. Dog Sal. Yeah, she's a great one. We've had her since she was a tiny little puppy. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. Really sweet. That's also why I put I put a dog on the cover of my second book because they are huh. just cute. <laughs> right. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. Right. So the meaning of what you've said is that the, the earlier you start and um, the probably the better communicator you are. Right. So those researchers who kind of were in the conditions where they had to learn early on how to communicate, then they became the best communicators now. And, and but um, OK, so how can we. Let's let's assume that we also have uh, because I think majority of PhD students also have um, relatives with higher education. At least some of them have higher education. So uh, how can we, uh, in these conditions, learn how to well communicate? Sure. Yeah, I guess I would say that it's not so much that they've started early as they've got a lot of practice doing it. And so that practice can begin at any point in your career. You know, once you learn what I would say, learn these sort of principles and approaches and get some training, the more you practice at whatever stage you're at, the better and better you're going to get. I mean, during my course, when, you know, students re re uh, record the first round, and then they record the second round. The second round is just a week later, and it's so much better than the first round when they didn't know, you know, when they had just started learning it. So the more you do it, the better and better you're going to get at it, you know, really at any stage. So look for opportunities, uh, which are all around us. You know, you have friends, uh, you know, who, who don't know what you do very well. Even other scientists who aren't in your area of specialty, um, don't know that much about, you know, how, 
you know, how you, uh, how you do your research. So there are opportunities all over the place um, for people to practice this. And so that's what I would say is once you get the training, just keep practicing. And what's going to happen is you're going to start to get good at this. And you're going to start getting compliments from people. One of the students, even the day after I did a quick fake Facebook live, you know, like three years ago, and it was a computational neuroscientist. And he uh, posted like the next day and he said, already today, I had a chance to try this out because my friends came by the lab and I usually get glazed looks is what he said. Um, but I got compliments. And, uh, and so, you know, this, so once you get compliments on something, usually that's a signal like, oh, maybe I should do some more of this, or that felt good. I probably should, you know, I like to feel good. Maybe I'll look for other opportunities to talk to groups or, or whatever. Um, and so it creates this virtuous cycle because the more you do it, the better you get, the more compliments you get, the more you want to do it, the better you get. So, um, it's really, I'm, I'm really hopeful and optimistic about this. You don't have to be first generation college. And I guess the last thing I'd say is the importance of this. So I kind of see the importance in several different ways. Certainly, if you're in a job interview and you're talking to someone who's unfamiliar, I mean, that's a pretty high stakes conversation if you want the job. Um, the other is, you know, if you are um, working in a corporate environment and you're talking to management or executives, and they're trying to make business decisions, and you need to use your expertise to help answer the question without telling them in eye-watering detail about the science. And, and that's something that, that happened actually to, um, to, to somebody uh, who, was in the, who was a PhD in organic chemistry. And he told me this story about it um, until he finally sort of got to the point, which was, you know, the business question and answering the business question, or you're starting a company, um, you're talking to all sorts of people, investors, and you're marketing it and all these types of things. And so these are high stakes situations, particularly as you know, um, because really so many uh, PhDs uh, don't stay in academia. Um, they need though to get the training to be able to do the translation of their of their work, I don't mean like translational science, but you know how to explain the value and importance of their work now to people, you know, a whole universe of people that they didn't interact with in the past. Right, indeed, uh, I, I have to say that here in the Netherlands, uh, it's often the case that uh, during our education process, all the way from uh, from like undergrad studies to the end of graduate studies, we don't really have that. I mean, we have a lot of focus put on our like scientific presentation, but with assumption that we talk to our environment, uh, right. such environment. Right. And yeah, it's often uh, it's often the case that the first actual uh, occasion you have, and when you actually have to explain what you've did, what what you've done in your PhD to uh to layman like in a layman talk mm -hmm. is at the end of your phd when you are giving your final presentation uh, during the public defense so the traditionally in the netherlands uh, a phd defense uh, lasts for exactly one hour um, which contains 10 minutes 10 minute presentation and 50 minutes uh, questioning from the committee and this 10 minutes is a lot of sweat for lots of uh, PhD candidates, including me myself. Uh, I graduated uh, more or less a year ago and I was shocked with how much time it took me to try to explain, because since the, this, this talk is meant to uh, be understandable to your grandma. So you have to- <laughs> Exactly. Explain everything you've done in four years or more and you know what you're proud of, uh, but squeeze it then in 10 minute presentation in a way that your grandma would understand. And, right. and for me, it was, I have to say a challenge and it took me many <laughs> attempts uh, to, to, to complete this task. And I, I, I'm still not sure if I reached that, reached that, uh, uh, yeah. that standards that were expected. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, yeah, I, I made the most colorful presentation that I possibly could think of. Uh, I'm not sure if that was necessarily the most understandable one, 
but I uh, but I get the I understand um, the pain. <laughs> And, yeah. um, I, I, I mean, uh, I think what you do is great. Uh, and I think uh, there should be definitely more focus put on this, um, si this side of, of communication uh, in our education process. So definitely for all of you guys who watch this episode and who are um, now in grad school or soon after, uh, you should definitely take a look at this uh, side of your expertise because sooner or later you, you will need it and the sooner as we mentioned before the sooner you start and the more practice you get the better you become so uh, highly recommended to check out uh, mark's uh, mark's courses and and, and coaching uh, i will link it below and here in the description Thank you. So you can uh, you can uh, you can find it easily and if you have any questions for Mark, then please contact him through LinkedIn. There will also be a link below, so uh, so you find him easily. Maybe uh, we could also share a piece of advice. Uh, so how to start? If you have a, like a mental blockade from talking to uh, to to like external audience, people without an education in the same direction, how can you start? If you if you've never done this before like maybe talking to the mirror first but <laughs> what would be the first thing to do if you if you had never had that type of experience before sure it's a it's a good question and i also want to say look this is not easy um when i was teaching my class yesterday uh, i have a a time in the course where there are breakout rooms and we've been doing this virtually now so can do it on Zoom. And when we came out of the breakout rooms, one of the participants said, it was a lot harder than I thought to talk about my research in a way that was clear to others who didn't have my academic specialty. So I want people to be kind to themselves, first of all, not expect perfection uh, at the beginning or even at the end. It's an iterative process. You know, you do this more and more and you refine it. So if you're starting, I think the number one thing is just to start, you know, just recognize, like you were saying, Natalia, that this is important. And then you say, well, okay, well, what do I, you know, do about it? And so it's very easy to, to say to a family member or a friend, uh, or a colleague that you trust, hey, you know, I want to start focusing on this a little bit more. Can I just describe to you, you know, what I do? And I'm going to try to make this appropriate for someone who's not familiar with all the details of the research. And just tell me what you think. Was it, did you understand everything? And what didn't you understand? Or, you know, I'm going to try to use some metaphors and describe, you know, what I do by comparing it to other things that you might be familiar with. Was that helpful? Did that work? You know, and, and then as you part, as you do this, um, you will start to get a signal sort of like we were talking about before your signals from your list. Oh, that was really interesting. Or, or tell me more. Um, I think, um, so I would encourage people. The number one thing is, is to start to just to get started and start with people that you know, that you like, that you trust, um, and, and just ask them for frank feedback on what you're saying and, and how could it be better and did this make sense or did that make sense? Would there be a better way to phrase something? I also want to say sort of a high-level approach or theme to keep in mind is you are showing someone the trailer of the movie you're not showing them the movie right so when you have these interactions think about like i'm just going to tell them the preview i'm not actually going to go through the entire plot of the movie right like so when you know sometimes i say think of yourself as a director of a two-hour movie Right. So many different things going on and characters and different actions that happen and, you know, mystery and things that you didn't expect and all of that. Um, and so now what you are as the director is you have to put together the trailer for that movie and it's going to be 30 seconds, right? It can only be 30 seconds. They're going to be, it's going to be up on YouTube all around, you know, streaming. It's a new Amazon uh, original series, you need to put together the trailer. Well, you can see, well, what do I include? 
what do I not mention? How do I explain the things that I am including, right? And, um, and so you'll see it's, it's not an easy task. But remember, when you're doing these descriptions, the idea isn't to try to cram all of this information just into a short time frame, like 30 seconds or a minute. The idea is to try to be um, more strategic in deciding what should be included and what doesn't need to be. And one of the things in that regard is the details and process steps are usually things that can be left on the cutting room floor while you focus on the results, the real world application, the relevance to regular people. That's what you want to do. But you're just showing the trailer. You're not showing the whole movie. Well, what, from what you've said before, I, I, was, I would call it an anti-trailer because uh, you have to start from the ending, right? So it's one major spoiler. <laughs> well, it's funny. If next time you watch a, a movie, um, pay attention to this. Actually, the movie now. We're not talking about the trailer necessarily. But how long does it take after the credits are over for something, uh, a big action to occur? Like that rivets. Usually someone gets killed or there's a crash, or there's some action that happens that's pretty dramatic right at the beginning, not long after the movie starts. It's often how, at least for these big, like Hollywood, if you will, movies, that's often what happens. And they're doing it for that reason that we sort of talked about. They need to hook your attention right away. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's fine. Uh, and so th that's just something just, just to, to think about next time you're watching a movie to see like, how long does it take from the movie beginning to actually have a major action occur? Because I want you, as you explain your research to start, like you were saying with this, this big thing, why, why are we doing this? Um, and I'm picking something, I'm picking a reason, an explanation that you understand and can relate to from your real life. That's, that's the Hitchcock style, right? Start from the earthquake and then... <laughs> yeah, right. Then it uh, takes off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, that's a uh, very good advice. Very good advice. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I, I've, I've seen uh, some, um, you know, uh, talking about movies um, and about the timing in movies, I've seen um, some comparisons between different MCU, uh, like superhero movies and uh, like scene after scene the timing of different like crucial events, including indeed deaths, bombings, like some action scenes and then romantic scenes and then the like fillers between them. Uh, it's all like almost the same. Like when you look at those movies, they like the topic is different. The characters are different, but the timing, it's almost like a melody. It's a melody and it's the same melody in every single movie. When you right. like contra like basically put them next to each other, you can see it's like just one kind of one screenplay. It's just different, like different details. Right. That's so interesting. Right. It's almost like plug and play. Um, we know that at five minutes twenty three seconds, we should have, you know, a a, a train you know, derailment because it's been one minute and 13 seconds since something big happened. Um, but yes, absolutely. There's definitely a formula to it. And it's a formula that's been around since the very, very beginning. I mean, I keep Aristotle's book, you know, Aristotle's writings uh, on rhetoric, you know, on my bookshelf. I mean, I look at it um, and, you know, the things that he talks about are things that we would recognize in our daily, daily uh, interactions, when we're watching TV, or, you know, we're, we're, we're listening to something, and someone's trying to make a point or advance or shape the way we think. These are rhetorical devices and techniques that have been around really since the beginning of oratory of, of public speaking, and they still work because 2000 years from an evolutionary standpoint, is not even a blink of an eye, probably, right. So, um, Yes, we're still wired to respond to that kind of stimuli and that kind of structure. Right. And um, uh, one thing I'd like to add to this conversation is that actually the, the ability to present um, and to, um, to give a lay layman talk about what you do is one of the most transferable skills there are. So 
uh, for me now, it's also I ha also have the necessity to explain uh, the rationale of what I do uh, when I build a company and when I build projects within a company. And I think I was just thinking about where else could you apply the same uh, the same skills? And it like I was thinking pretty much everywhere, wherever you go in the job markets, uh, you start working in a corporation or you start your own business, uh, the ability to pitch, it's basically the ability to, to give a pitch and uh, it will be useful absolutely everywhere. So, so this is one of these skills that as a, there should, you know, there should be a number of skills that are a bit like, a, like an airbag, you know, this is like, Oh yeah. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. It's your, like, it's sort of like uh, your safety net or your security blanket or something like that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's funny too, even I was thinking like when you're calling customer service, cause there's something wrong, you know, like your, you know, your refrigerator or whatever it is, like, you know, you, you could, you want to make it quick and concise too. Right. And so you can even think about, well, you know, it's broken and then talk a little bit like, okay, well, a little bit of background on that rather than going into all these little, you know, minute detail. I came down this morning and I happened to look that, you know, I didn't hear the noise and, you know, so you just, you know, you can, you can use that sort of discipline, so to speak, that structure in every interaction that you have. I've had friends, you know, one of my students said, um, you know, she was talking to friends um, you know, from home and, you know, she wants to make what her research, she's passionate about her research. She wants to make it interesting and accessible to those people. And so she uses these kind of techniques as well, you know, in talking, just, you know, just talking to friends. Right. Yeah. I'm actually working on this. Uh, I'm thinking of creating a list of like top 10 transferable skills that are useful absolutely everywhere. Like, I think that the number one is still kindness. This is something that you cannot really, uh, you cannot really top that. This is uh, useful in absolutely every job, every profession, everywhere. Uh, but actually p pitching is somewhere like really would be very, very high on this list as well. So, uh, because I, I think we often, as researchers, uh, we often focus on these like hard skills, like, you know, specialistic skills way way too much and um and we yeah we treat these soft skills as something that is not necessarily uh, as important to learn first because it's so non-specific and we are like everyone you know everyone has the skill this doesn't make me any unique you know but i'm one of these 10 people in the world who can solve this type of equation this mm -hmm. makes me special so let's hone the skill because this makes me special but we don't really realize that without uh, these like simple human skills that everyone has uh, it will stop us in our careers anyway so these are the ob obligatory things we should know uh, and this is this is like you know level number one of, or level zero and only then after you have an ability to communicate what you do it actually mattered what you what you did right Right. It's so true. And I, you know, looked into this question of why is it called soft skills? You know, because I think sometimes that is taken as being derogatory or is not as important as the hard skills. Right. Um, and so I was, um, uh, I had an opportunity to interview uh, a woman who is uh, in the life sciences industry in Boston. And she and colleagues wrote an article, uh, an op ed actually in Scientific American, uh, where they talked about the types of skills employers want in the biotech space. And as part of that research, they came across this idea of, um, of soft skills versus hard skills. So they looked at what, why did that even begin? And so the origin of this dichotomy or descriptions of hard versus soft really started in the US Army um, you know, back 50, 60, 70 years ago. And there was no derogatory or there was no disparaging or negative um, sentiment associated with it. It was simply, okay, if you have a hard skill, that means you're working on a machine that's made out of metal, that's hard. If you don't do any kind of work around machines made out of metal, then you don't have hard skills. So the opposite is soft skills. <laughs> that's it. Um, so there's no, there was nothing derogatory about 
this soft skills, but I think it has taken on a negative connotation as being fluff or not as important. I guess the one thing I would say, and you've alluded to this, Natalia, when it comes to this kind of thinking, is that, you know, a, an idea that you have as a researcher. So there's an expression, you know, an idea without action is just a dream. Right. And one of the reasons I got into this is because I wanted to empower scientists to actually get their ideas and discoveries out into the world more broadly and acted upon. Right. And that's only going to happen if you can talk to the rest of the world about what you do. And it's not an innate skill that you might be born with to be able to do that. Um, some people may be better than others, but even people who are you know, pretty comfortable um, really need to learn um, more about how to do it systematically and, and really do it in a way that's repeatable. Um, and it's not, it's not easy. Uh, it's something that you really, I feel really need to learn and to practice just like any other skill, maybe in the lab or in your, you know, in your work as a researcher specifically. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, I, I I didn't know about the genesis of uh, of the terminology hard versus mm -hmm. soft skills. I have to say, but of course Americans came up with it. Americans are always responsible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, I mean, here like in Europe we joke sometimes that you know Americans have biggest you know trees, biggest cars, biggest everything. Americans, you know, it's all Americans. Fault. It's, right. We're, uh, we're we're yeah. Right. Uh, well, I mean, I, myself, I, I like my suspicion. I, I was I thought about it once, and my suspicion was that hard skills are measurable skills. So if you you know if you if you uh, like that was my guess. Uh, I didn't know about the that story, but mm -hmm. like I thought you know the skills such as ability to uh, let's say do good quality writing or uh, ability to yeah solve some type of equations or a program in certain language these are the abilities you can grade somehow you can design a task to test them but like soft skills are more uh, the ability to let's say communicate it's it's hard to really come up with categories how to measure this type of skill so this was uh, for me, that that was my guess, but uh, yeah, but exactly. And one way that I'll I could sort of add to that a little bit, maybe um, as far as measurability, which is such an important point, because usually what's measured gets done. You know, if we can measure something, then we know we're making progress. So I'd encourage people to think about output versus outcome. So an outcome, you know, we'll start with output, you know, yes, I can measure how many experiments did I run this week and all those sorts of things. Those are quantitative, right? Those that's output, but the outcome is really the consequences. So what actually occurred in the real world as a result of that? And that, if it can't be measured, it can be understood. Um, you know, we changed the law or now there's a new way of getting your insulin that doesn't require needles because of this science or now more people don't have covid because we came up with this vaccine and all these people are vaccinated and the economy is starting to turn you know obviously we're not done with covid but um in any case um so if you think about output versus outcome you know they're really I would say I almost view output as almost like an interim step. You know, if we had this idea that we should require all cargo to be screened and we wrote all these letters and we could measure how many letters we sent, but did it actually change the policy and require cargo to be air cargo to be screened? Well, it did in our case, but we had to really work to make that happen and apply a lot of these types of persuasion and advocacy and negotiation and communication skills to make that happen. Right. Well, fantastic. I think we have to slowly come, come to the end of, of this episode. So like, let me ask you, uh, let me still ask you uh, some really nasty corporate question, <laughs> Go ahead. which is how, yeah, this is the usual, usual suspect. So, how do you see yourself in 10 years from now? Yeah, you know, I would just, um, I would like to be continuing to reach more people um, with my 
teaching. Um, I do, in addition to the workshop and the course and the one-on-one -on -one coaching, I do keynote talks. I did one for the National Organization for Research Development Professionals. So people in universities who are pulling faculty together to go after really large grants. Um, so they have a national organization. So I did one, I did a keynote talk for about 700 uh, people there. Um, and then, um, so the, the keynote talks is, is something that I'd like to continue to do because I feel like that can reach a lot of, of folks. So I really enjoy and love what I get to do every day. I really enjoy working with scientists and researchers, social scientists, natural scientists. I also work with engineers um, as well. And so I would just like to kind of continue doing what I'm doing. I don't have any like um, aspirations to like take over the world with this, <laughs> so to speak, but, um, you know, to continue to, to reach more, more people. Fantastic. All right. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Mark, for all your sure, thanks, great insights. And uh, I'm uh, absolutely bought. I'm convinced I am. I think I'm starting to, to polish, polish my communication skills uh, starting today. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, you, you, you have a you have a big head start because you already do it well. Oh, yeah, sure. I think um, I'm definitely like, uh, I mean, uh, but you convinced me. Absolutely. Uh, I wish I should definitely uh, look into this. And you guys, if you're uh, curious, uh, please check uh, check out Mark's uh, website and his uh, his workshops. Um, definitely, definitely. Uh, yeah, must uh, must see. And uh, thank you so much, Mark, uh, for, for your visit today and for all the knowledge you, uh, you shared with us. And um, for all of you guys who would like to get more of this type of content, please subscribe to the channel. And uh, till next time. Great. Thanks, Natalia. And I would say I have a free resource as well that you'll find on my website. Um, the website is you know, bearstrategic.com. I know it'll probably be in the uh, in the notes for the episode. Um, but I have what I put together. Um, it's an infographic. It's 11 keys to communicating complexity or 11 keys for translating complexity, I think is what it's officially called. Um, it's free. If you go to bearstrategic.com, um, you can put your email in and you can get your very own 11 keys to translating complexity. All right, great. Uh, that I will do that in a second. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank Mark. you. I uh, enjoyed it. Thanks very much.